Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us for this session on Built Environment Transformation Dialogue. My name is Roland Honziker and I'm the Director for the Built Environment at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's my great pleasure to host this discussion here as part of the Stockholm Plus 50 Dialogue um, because the value chain transformation is really at the core of the strategy of the World Business Council. Um, especially when we look at the built environment in its very fragmented um, stage, it is so important that we all work together. So I'd like to thank you for joining us. Uh, we are co-hosting this discussion with the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, of which we are the co-chair of the steering committee, and really making sure that we work globally and collaborative on the transformation of this sector. We will hear it shortly uh, from our colleague Jorge at UNEP, some critical numbers of this sector. 40% of global emissions come from the built environment, 40% of resource use goes into the built environment, and 40% of waste streams come from the built environment. So it is a massive challenge, but also opportunity for us to address. The reason it's complicated is that the sector is very fragmented. We have a planning and design process, um, which is driven by interests of developing uh, new areas, new buildings, new neighborhoods. It goes into a construction process, and then ultimately people use um, buildings and, uh, and infrastructure, and the three are not sufficiently connected in terms of the decision making. So the challenge we have is how do we take a more life cycle perspective across that decision making process? And that is what we are about in WBCSD, but also the Global Alliance. How can we develop that common vision and that common approach that we all need to uh, work towards? We have been leading under the Global Alliance uh, a work we call market transformation towards net zero. And that starts with two enablers, how um, we can create that transformation. The first is to have a clear common vision. Um, and we will hear about that uh, today. A sector with 40% of greenhouse gas, we need to halve these emissions by 2030, and we need to be net zero by latest 2050. So we know where we need to go to, and we know we need to radically and deeply collaborate to achieve that because wherever a company sits in the value chain, it cannot achieve this massive transformation on its own. And there's a few critical levers to help us in this transformation. Again, looking at full life cycle, we need to look at CO2 emissions that come out of the full process, so-called whole life carbon, material emissions, construction process emissions, as well as the emissions from the use phase. So we need to look at these together, we need to, as we talked this morning in terms of transparency and our accountability that are so critical, we need to look at all these emissions uh, together in order to be able to drive that to net zero. And we need to start looking at carbon as we look at price. We would not build without knowing the cost. We also should not build without knowing the carbon that goes into construction. And that will help us improve that decision making. And ultimately, we need to change that demand and supply relationship so that we see also developers, cities, investors starting to put requirements on lower carbon performance so that the value chain can really deliver to that. Now, this is not only about carbon. Stockholm agenda, we are looking at the three interrelated emergencies, climate emergency, nature loss, and mounting inequality. So we also need in the built environment policies that encourage integrated infrastructure development and that look at nature-based solutions. And we are working at the moment on the global goals for nature. We're looking at how do we translate that into the built environment. So again, that across the value chain, we can really embed nature much more into what we build. And also social equity. We need to Im Im bring in labor standards, health and safety standards, and we need to ensure access to decent housing to vulnerable and poor populations, and we need to reduce energy poverty. So these are 
all challenges that we can only tackle through the transformation along the, the value chain. With this, it is my pleasure now to introduce to you the first speaker, Jorge Laguna Celis, who is the head of the One Planet Network, which is the delivery mechanism for the UN Framework of Programs on Sustainable Consumption and Production, the 10YFP. Jorge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roland. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I really want to start by thanking and appreciating this excellent initiative of Stockholm Environment Institute, World Business Council on Sustainable Development and Swedish government to hold the multi-stakeholder hub. And especially because we are in an event of the Global Alliance on Buildings and Construction uh, to recognize the wonderful work that this alliance is delivering together with WBCSD. I came here today in representation of our executive director, Inger Anderson, who is also the secretary general of the conference and through UNEP in its partnership as being part of the secretariat of this great alliance. I represent the One Planet Network, which is, as Roland mentioned, the delivery mechanism a multi-stakeholder partnership that supports through the enabling conditions that we just heard now that are critical for the transformation of our current built environment. These enabling conditions in which we work consistently and advocate for are public procurement. Governments are the first buyers of the infrastructure that it's been developed, of the buildings that are being created, of the roads that are being paved consumer information that consumers need to be aware of the materials that they are using, of the sustainability ratings of the products that they are acquiring, of the durability of the products that they are using. We also work on digitalization, which is an emerging trend that we have to look at, and other enabling conditions such as lifestyles and education, teaching people, sharing people, sharing with people, different ways in which we can live sustainably without further consuming. We can live in sustainable and provide sustainable housing in an affordable way by using more local materials, finance and social inclusion as well. We believe that these conditions, these enabling programs help support the implementation of the actions of the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction. So that is why I am delighted to welcome you to this hybrid event, Stockholm Plus 50, Built Environment Transformation Dialogue, which, as I mentioned, is organized by WBCSD and the Global Alliance on Buildings and Construction. As Roland mentioned, the buildings and construction sector is a very high emitting sector. In 2020, it accounted for 37% of energy-related CO2 emissions, with over a quarter of these emissions coming from the production of building materials and construction activities. And yet, half of the buildings standing that we will require by 2050 have not been built. Providing affordable housing for the global population and meeting the demands of future generations will require rethinking profoundly the sector. The built environment is responsible for approximately 7% of global employment or more than 200 million jobs and accounts, and this is very important for over 11 and 13% of global GDP. In the language that we use every day, in the way we work, this is what we call a high impact sector, like agriculture. If you work on this sector, if you shift the trend, you can achieve multiple benefits, you can achieve multiple goals, but you need to be coordinated, you need to have a long-term vision, and you need to have a long-term plan. If you continue business as usual, we will not meet neither the targets on decarbonization nor the targets on resource use, nor the targets on pollution. Cities hold the key for a sustainable future. And that is why this Global Alliance on Buildings and Construction was founded and established in COP21 to align the sector with the Paris Agreement goals, to overcome sector fragmentation and to support the transition towards a zero emission, efficient and resilient buildings and construction sector. Global ABC, as we heard, its creation filled the gap. And this is something extremely transformative of this type of partnerships that we want to showcase in this conference. All the relevant actors are on equal footing. 
the governments that are driving the decisions, the large industries that you will see here and have an opportunity to have a dialogue today. I had the privilege of meeting two already that are bringing in the commitments, changing their business models and leading uh, the way within their industry are critical, but also stakeholders and other actors. So therefore, it is a truly multi-stakeholder platform. From my perspective, that is the future of multilateralism. Let me now uh, speak uh, to some of the common vision that Global ABC advances and, 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 and tr moves forward. The vision of the Global ABC is, as we heard by Roland, by 2030, the built environment should have halved its emission, whereby by either 100% of new buildings must be net zero carbon in operations with widespread energy efficiency, retrofit of existing assets and embodied carbon must be reduced by at least 40%. Providing these quantifiable and measurable targets is also a key element of this coalition. The ambition is also that by 2050, at the latest, at the latest, right, Roland, all new and existing assets must be net zero across the whole life cycle, including operational and embodied emission. And today we're going to be discussing how are we going to achieve that. Let me just conclude with three messages that we leave for our discussion today. The first one is that decarbonizing the sector requires a whole life carbon approach that addresses both operational and embodied carbon. The second message, it's really something that we advocate for all of the high impact sectors. We require policies that encourage integrated infrastructure, including drawing on nature-based solutions and including the benefits in valuations and decision making. In essence, what we call it's a systems approach. It cannot be solved only by working with the construction industry. It has to be solved by an inclusive approach. And the last message that I leave with you, which is extremely important in this conference today, that it's about the three pillars of sustainable development, is to embed social equity into construction projects leaving no one behind, ensuring that standards, quality, affordability and materials are fit for purpose and meet the demands of users and therefore achieving the sustainable development goals. So we have an interesting panel today on behalf of UNEP and really to appreciate the wonderful leadership that you have provided, Roland, and the team that is working behind in this important initiative and to pledge our support as One Planet Network to implement its outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge, for these opening words. And thank you for the support of UNEP, also to the Global Alliance for Buildings, to the One Planet Network, to really help us drive this common approach. Um, and I think it's a bit in the spirit of this conference, and my colleague Dominic said that this morning, um, we're really seeing these silos starting to break apart, where business is here, governments are here, cities here, academia in a different place, but we really need to work on this together. And I think with the panelists who are now going to join us, we go a little bit into that transformation and that collaboration to really make that happen. So thank you very much, Jorge, for kicking us off. With that, I would like to uh, now ask my panelists to come up. We have um, a hybrid panel. So I'd like to welcome on stage Magali Anderson, who is the Chief Sustainability and Innovation Officer of Holzim, to our right. Me? <laughs> Lena Höck, the Executive Vice President for Sustainability and Innovation at Skanska. And we are joined online by Anne-Louise Löckholm, who is the President of Sweco Sweden. Andre Asud, who is senior advisor to the C40 cities and also uh, works at the city of Oslo in the climate uh, action team. And Tom Sanya, you are senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town, dedicating his work to mitigation and adaptation in the built environment. So it is a great pleasure to have you all here with us. I will try to get comfortable as well. Uh, is stall myself here. Um, Tom, I would like to start with you. I actually see you here in front of me, so that's great. Um, in your work, you, might need to. you speak from a... If you want to hear, you need to uh, put on the, the headset. Yeah. 
sorry, for the people here in the room, if you want to hear the online speakers, you also have to uh, take on the headsets, uh, otherwise you will not hear. Um, Tom, so speaking from a continent that is yet to substantially urbanize further, and where construction is often part of the informal economy, what are some of the main drivers that you see for more sustainable practice? Um, thank you very much. I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, and can I please yeah, have the slides for Tom so that he can speak to the slides? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll wait for the slides. Can you see them? Yes. Uh, thank you. So yes, uh, my name is uh, Tom Sanya. Um, I, I teach in South Africa in the University of Cape Town, and I'm originally from Uganda. Um, the slides have disappeared, but but uh, that, that's okay. We can okay. see them here. Um, okay. Can yeah. you see them online? Uh, do you have? It. Do you hear? Roland, Tom, if you see the slides on your side, I think we can. Yes, just... we so we can see them here in the room. Okay, th yeah. that's fine. We we can we can just proceed. Yeah. So as I was saying, I teach in the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, I originally come from Uganda, and uh, uh, the pictures on my slide, the little hut in the middle, that's uh, uh, a building which I built uh, right in my village, and the one next to it is another one which I built for my mother using the local labor that you're seeing. Uh, worked also deep in the village, planted trees, uh, and you can also see the division of labor between uh, men and women. And yeah, that's pretty much what the situation in Africa is. And uh, um, I do come from uh, these areas. And, and that I did with the uh, adobe, which is a uh, sun dried block. So uh, next slide, please. So um, it, in the next slide, we see uh, the problems which have been talked about by the previous speakers. So, um, uh, Africa population is growing, and you can see uh, that it's also urbanizing. And it's predicted that by 2030, most of the population in Africa will be urbanized. Currently, we have over 600 million people who are urbanized, and most of those are in the informal settlements. Uh, the top right graphic shows that most of the construction um, in the next few years, in the next, uh, uh, like starting in the mid uh, century, in the mid 21st century, is going to happen in Africa. Most of the new built spaces are going to be happening right here in Africa. Next slide, please. But then this is the Africa that we are looking at. Uh, mentioned that uh, most of it is informal, and that has been uh, recognized on the top, we have Nairobi, you have the former city, and then you have the informal city. The informal city in Nairobi is where um, up to more than 60% of the people are living. And you can say that for most of the countries in Africa. Indeed, uh, in Africa, 40% of the population is living in informal settlements. Uh, this is uh, poor sanitation. This is um, uh, very, very poor housing and very, very crowded conditioned conditions. For example, in Nairobi, um, it's about 45 square meters per person, both inside and, and outside. And, and you also saw Lagos uh, with the overcrowding, with uh, you know, the traffic congestion. And these are all encumbrances that people have to live with every day. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this shows that the informal sector in Africa is dominant. And in, in Uganda, for instance, uh, about 60% of the, of the economy um, is informal. And when we say informal, the pictures on the upper left corner are showing what that means. Uh, people are working by themselves using whatever means they have. And in one of those pictures, they have a brick kiln. And uh, one of the pictures shows a mansion. So the mansions, you know, swanky as they might look in Uganda, most of them are produced through the informal sector. So predominantly in Uganda, the informal sector is producing the built environment uh, in terms of the buildings. Uh, next slide, please. And so if we are looking to the future, when Roland was 
introducing, he talked about design, uh, about the you know, whole life cycle to approach to, to, to the built environment, design, um, construction, and occupation. Now, looking at the informal sector, which is dominating the construction in Uganda, they, there is hardly any design happening in this, you know, and it's, it's not a process, it's not something that you can actually look at and, uh, and describe in um, the sort of uh, rational categories that we are used to. The categories are very different, they are shifting all the time, and, and they evolve very, very quickly. So the challenge is immense. And um, when you think about how to approach it um, in this graphic here, um, starting at the very bottom with the black circle, uh, you have, let's say, informal settlements, which are very disorganized and ramshackled and so on. And this particular graphic is taken from uh, South Africa where the government is very committed based on its uh, right-based constitution to transform informal settlements. But despite that, there is, they haven't quite managed to catch up and informal settlements are growing and we, are, we have such a huge housing backlog. There are a, a myriad of policies. Uh, there is money which is invested by government and government has set responsibilities um, for where for who does everything but within all of that it's almost impossible for any actor at whatever level to know uh, their position within the setup and how they can make the maximum impact and so this organization called isandla took a, like a view um, in which they um, presented how the policy situation is and how different monies are in order to empower the actors in the informal sector so Roland, I would like to end it there because I believe my time is up, unless you tell me I still have a minute. We will come back, Tom. So yes, for a yeah, first okay. intervention. Thank you very much. But yeah. I think you said something, and we go back to seeing you all uh, on the screen. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think you said something really <laughs> interesting. Design is not happening. And maybe it's something we can come back to in, in, in the second round. Um, how can different stakeholders work together. You mentioned the government, but also finance who has to come in. So what, what could be done that we, we, we can change that and help people come out of this informal situation into a more planned situation? Because that is really a, a, key, a key issue that we need to look at. But let me, uh, maybe in order to have a bit of a conversation with, with everyone, I will go from hybrid to in-person so that we, we, we play with that. I would like to turn to you, Lena. Um, Skanska is one of the largest construction companies in the world. I think you're the sixth largest, maybe fifth by now, uh, because you are very successful, I hope. But you are also a developer. So you're sitting at a very pivotal um, place in the whole value chain. Um, what are your challenges, but also opportunity as you try to transform your company, um, but also how you work with your wider ecosystem up and down the value chain? Thank you so much, Roland. And um, key for us is, of course, we have set forth a direction with our science-based climate target. And for us then also to identify the actions sort of how we are going to get there. And amongst those are, of course, you, you can start with looking at your own emissions. And in, and in the construction industry, it's quite a lot when it comes to energy and fuels that is actually being used during the construction site. And, and for us to be able to shift, for example, to green energy as well as to fossil free uh, fuels, so electrify, efficiencies, there's some transports not needed to be, to be done if you're more efficient and you can work with digital tools to, to have a better efficiency and also to turn to biofuels. However you're doing that, you need to work with your value chain to make that actually happen. And we're doing quite a shift now to biofuels in all of UK, for example, and by that actually working together with our uh, value chain. However, to, to make the true shift, and this is just our own carbon emission, and we have halved those the past six years. So we have had quite a good success on that. However, what we really need to focus on is 
the, the, the emissions coming from materials as well as to, for the energy that is needed to, to use the buildings for a lifespan. So, so the energy needed for 50 years for whatever we build is going to be there for quite some time. So we have to think long term. So when it comes to materials, for us to use low carbon materials, first of all, you need to have the data. You need to be able to, just like you do with quality and cost, be able to already when you set forth a design, actually when we buy land as a developer, to start to look into what will, what is our direction, what is our target for this kind of building, and by that starting to look into the design, what kind of materials and what kind of design will we be using, and by that being able to significant, significantly reduce the carbon emissions. And you are going to talk more about that, Magali, regarding some of the low carbon uh, materials. So that is of utterly importance, but also for us, and that's also set in the very design of the building, it is, is it an energy plus building? That is an, a building that's actually producing more energy than what it's needed through its lifespan. So actually produce energy through solar and geothermal solutions than what is needed for producing materials, for constructing the building, as well as to operate the building. So cooling and heating and lighting the building during 50 years. And we are able to actually develop these kinds of amazing buildings today. So just think about your expectations on buildings that we need to kind of step up our game here. What a building can do for you. It does not have to be something taken from the grid. It can actually add to the grid. The buildings we had done, the powerhouse, as we call it, because it is really a powerhouse. You're actually able to, to uh, charge and, and, and to, to power up electrical vehicles and buses by the house and the energy that it has produced. So talking about the ecosystem, talking about value chains, so all of a sudden the construction and the built environment really need to be an integral part of how you produce and how you energy, as well as to understand the future transportation system, as well as then to collaborate with all of those that are producing the materials that is needed. So in that way, if you set forth your target, a clear action plan, but also if you're humble enough to realize you can't do this yourself, if you set your expectations high, you better team up with the others that do likewise so. Thank you, uh, Lena. I really like that um, statement on changing expectations. Um, and I've, I've, I've heard you talk about that before, and it's really passionate. How can we reimagine the built environment and the buildings we create? They don't need to be energy neutral. They should actually provide energy. Um, but again, to do that, and maybe we come to that in a, in a second round, you probably need to convince also some others. That's not something you can just deliver if the client you're working for doesn't see it that way. So I, I'd be quite interested to maybe come to that uh, afterwards. But I'd like to turn um, now to Andre. Uh, Andre, you are with the city of Oslo and we had your mayor uh, yesterday in uh, one of the events here in Stockholm um, and it was really inspiring uh, to hear also uh, the leadership that your mayor is taking. We, we often say investors, developers, owners, they are, they are the end users, they need to drive the change. But it's ultimately cities who can set regulation, who can provide the permitting for land use, and you're very large owners yourselves as well. So how do, you, how do cities use this influence on the building's value chain um, to drive that change? Thank you, Roland, and thank you for inviting me to this, um, this uh, panel discussion. Um, yes, I very much agree that uh, you know, uh, cities are at the, the core of this to a large extent. Um, both in terms of the influence they can have um, and also um, uh, in terms of where the, the sort of the growth of the urban, urban or the, the built environment is going to happen. If you, if you follow the, the UN forecast for urban growth to 2050, we essentially have to build a city the size of Stockholm every week. I repeat, every week until 2050. So... It goes without saying that what happens in cities is, is fundamental. Um, I now mainly work for the C40 network. So, uh, I mean, um, uh, but also a little bit for the city of Oslo. 
so bringing both perspectives in a way. But um, uh, for those of you who don't know the C40 network, that's a, a global network of uh, 97 of the, the world's mega cities uh, co collaborating on, on bringing uh, cl good climate change policies to, to cities. And within that, we have a, a, something we call the Clean Construction Program that work with uh, um, 40 of these cities to, to try to advance this agenda. And uh, from that network, uh, we, see, um, we see cities using their influence in different ways. Um, I think, I mean, some cities maybe haven't fully understand how much uh, potential influence they have on the built environment from a sort of a climate change and, and the nature-based solutions point of view. Um, and also cities, of course, city powers differs a lot uh, around the globe. So uh, they are larger in some regions uh, of the world and, and uh, well, other, other places they have less influence. I think there are some, some key, key elements that cities, we see cities doing. Uh, one uh, was already mentioned in the introduction is public procurement. Cities are owners of, um, of, um, of buildings and infrastructure and developers as well. So there's a lot cities can do just by setting requirements in their public procurement. We see them using permitting as a, a way to require uh, things like deconstruction rather than demolition. So actively using uh, uh, permitting in this way. Uh, we see some cities creating um, hubs for reusing materials. Uh, both physical and digital hubs, uh, also uh, a very important step for increasing increasing the reuse of build, building materials. Uh, there's also the use of zoning regulation uh, to uh, to push for for cleaner construction and the cleaner value chain. Um, and um, and finally, I would mention, I mean, city planning processes are are very important and is a way to to enter the this this question and and change change sort of the, the sustainability of the sector at an early stage and to get in on at an early stage I think is is very very important because for instance with, with building materials uh, there are choices being made that make it very difficult to have a big impact on reducing emissions from materials unless you get in at an early design stage to to make these choices so. Um, I think those are some examples of, of how cities use their influence, um, and um, I'm happy to discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andre, and also for the uh, inspiring leadership we see from the cities working in the C40 network and learning from each other. And I'm also pleased to see that there is dialogue with industry as well. We saw that yesterday in the event, but also in your in your forum, so that we really we can have these conversations. How we do that, um, and. This material reuse, I think that is a fascinating area. Um, it is uh, in our Stockholm action agenda, circularity is actually a very key aspect as well. So yeah, how do we start actually reusing and what needs to be in place to do that? Um, perfect segue um, for you, Magali. You're representing one of the largest cement and concrete manufacturers in the world, Holtzim. The industry has addressed the issue around climate and biodiversity for a long time, but I think we can say at the moment you're really quite in the spotlight as, as an industry and, and you're, you're also ramping up and working with all the producers. Um, Holzim has taken very um, clear targets as well. How, how are you going to deliver to these very ambitious targets? Thank you, Roland. And, um Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm the material that Lena needs to build better, as she's been explaining, and that the city of Stockholm needs. So we took a target on, I will talk mo mostly of the climate, because we took also targets on biodiversity and nature, but let's concentrate on climate. If not, I will take way too long. On the climate side, we um, took a net zero target to 2050, but more importantly, we validated our 2030 and 2050 target by science-based target initiative um, on the three scopes, knowing that in our case, scope one by large is, so our own emission, contrary to you, Lena, <laughs> is by large our highest uh, amount of CO2. Um, as you said, Roland, the, the construction of the cement sector in particular have been doing a lot over, over the years. 
Uh, Holcim, for example, we have reduced by 29% since 1990 our CO2 per ton of cementitious. So that's quite a lot. Way not enough. We are all in agreement with that. And I think what's happening today and what we are seeing in our sector, and particularly in Holcim, is a very strong acceleration. So we want to go way faster than the reduction we've been doing. And, and for that, what's happening, what we are seeing today is going to allow that acceleration. It's going to allow because there is an alignment over the full value chain that everyone has to accelerate. How we are going to accelerate? Well, we work on the product itself. So I could enter into technical details, but I won't because that would bore too many people. But we know how to reduce the CO2 we use uh, to heat up the kiln by replacing the fossil fuel by um, waste, biomass, etc. And then we reduce what we call the clinker factor, which is the most emitting part of the cement by replacing by some waste. That's what we've been doing over the year. We are going to accelerate and that will take us to 2030. So we know how to do that. We have plants today that run at 100% replacement. Uh, I forgot to say for the sake of Tom that uh, targets we have are global. It's not just for Europe, it's for all the world. And we have quite a strong presence, um, including in South Africa and in, in Uganda. Um, but then 2030, to go to that next step that will take us to zero, there will be some remaining emission that the only way to get it off will be by doing carbon capture. That there will be no choice. And uh, I won't go there today, but because that requires a, a whole discussion by itself. I'd rather go to your uh, comment on circular economy. Yeah. Circular economy plays an absolutely key role in the way we decarbonize. Well, first of all, because when we replace fossil fuels, we replace it by waste. When we replace the clinker, we replace by byproduct of other industries. And for example, last year, we used 54 million tons of waste in our processes. 54 million tons. Um, I don't know if you guys know Veolia, the, the West French waste company. That makes us as big as them. So a lot of people um, say we are waste companies that the cement as a byproduct. I like that say, so waste we use a lot. But what we are talking here is not just how we can reuse waste of other industries, is how we become circular as an industry. And that I think is even more interesting, is how we capture the, what us we call construction demolition waste. So basically those buildings you were talking about that needs to be demolished, how we deconstruct them and how we do the best usage of that waste. If we could reuse directly the panels, if panels were um, precast in such a way we could reuse them, of course that would be ideal, but in the meantime, we can take the rubbles and put it straight in the cement. We do that in Switzerland. We put 20% of this rubble straight back in cement, so straight reduction of 20% CO2. That's pretty basic, simple math. Um, we only do it in, in, in Switzerland because that's the only country in the world where the norms allow it. So we would love to do it everywhere else. Europe should allow that norm um, by the end of this year, so we'll be able to deploy. And, and I will just continue, finish by what I've mentioned now for answering to you, Roland, is what we do at product level. But I think what is even more important is what we do at built environment level. And this is where collaborating with, with Lena and, and um, that sector is so important for us because we really need to build more with less. And I know when I say that, as I sell concrete, people are asking me, what do you mean? You want to sell less concrete? Exactly. For the same object, I want to sell less concrete. Because with the type of, of construction that needs to happen, that has been mentioned before, we're going to need so much concrete anyway that it's OK to sell, to sell less per object or per infrastructure. And that today is not happening because the business model is not made that way. Today, I'm incentivized to sell a lot of concrete. I get paid by cubic meter of concrete I sell. And the more cubic meter of concrete I sell, the better. If tomorrow I was getting paid to build a bridge, but not, but independently of how much concrete I put in it, then I would be very much incentivized to put as little concrete as possible and making sure that it holds, of course. <laughs> And I think that business model for me is really where the value chain can work together and when we can progress way quicker than just at product level. Thank you so much, uh, Magali. I think you really illustrate that change that needs to happen. Um, 
the business model, how we are incentivized what to deliver, but back also to that change of expectation. It's not just putting up a concrete wall. We need to think, what do we want to deliver? And maybe um, we could reflect a little bit more, so how do we change these business models? What, what, what is really that maybe one or two key drivers that will help us, that, that we can all deliver to the same? Um, anne Louise, I'd like to turn to you um, last but not least, so there has to be always an order, but I'm particularly interested um, to hear from you. Um, tell me if that's correct, but Sueco, you're a, a leading architecture and engineering firm and you advise many public and private clients on how they can build better. You do the planning and you do the project management, but you have your own commitments, but how do you then also convince the organizations you're working for um, to implement that? And, and what, what's some best practice that you see uh, from Sueco? Okay, a, br a broad question. Very broad. Hi, everyone, and uh, and thank you for letting me be part of this exciting uh, um, meeting. I really like what I hear, and I just want to start by saying a lot of the things that we are talking about here now, we already know and already do. And I think uh, the last speaker here really nailed it by talking about targets. And I would like to add bold leadership to that list. I don't think we can talk enough about the leadership that's needed. Because if we already now know a lot on how to act, then we need to be bold in implementing it and uh, talk about it and dare talk about it. And um, when you join Sveco as an employee, you come into a network with competence. We have a lot of competence. I mean, we work work broadly in society and the background or the idea behind Sveco is really to combine competence. So then it's for me to make sure that they have the right uh, focus, that they have the right competence in connection to sustainability and that they dare to bring it up as advisors, just as you were pointing at. And uh, that we teach our employees from, from day one. That's something I talk about plenty when I'm out meeting my, my colleagues. But we also need the cooperation between us and our clients. We need procurement and specifically public procurement to ask and have the right targets and ask the right questions, uh, which we don't really see enough about today. There are good examples, and actually one of the examples we, we find in, in Norway uh, on the public side, which we then bring into Sweden and talk about uh, and uh, try to get into the public sector here. I think in Norway we also see a really good competence about wood buildings. They are further ahead than we are in Sweden. They have the tallest building, for instance. We see uh, in UK that they are further in head when it comes to CO2 calculations in infrastructure, which we then adopt into Swedish organization. We also have Netherlands in our organization, and you know they're really far, further ahead when it comes to innovation procurements, uh, but also climate adaptations. They have a lot of water in the country. And something really to, to point out here, they when we look at the circularity index, they have a circularity of 14%, while in Sweden we have 3.4. And there are really good examples in Sweden as well. We now have clients who want to uh, bring down a current uh, building and reuse 100% of it, which connects to the concrete question where we bring down walls, clean it, and we put it together again. Um, I think we also can... I would like to take the chance because we mentioned before here uh, early on to connect cost and CO2. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also spoke about digitalization. And I think there's a marriage that needs to be done between sustainability and, and digitalization. And today we are just dating each other. Um, we just launched a new tool called C3. It's a carbon cost compass, which you use in early stages to really look at cost and how much uh, CO2 footprint you will uh, bring out by making different choices. 
So there are good examples out there which we just need to use and have the, the leadership to bring in and the right measurements to, to dare to try out new things. Thank you, uh, Anne-Louise. So we have the tools, we have the examples. Uh, you mentioned the question of leadership and mm. also collaboration. Um, maybe let's stay a moment in Sweden. Um, Lena Skanska was leading um, a, a project really to bring the construction sector together in Sweden. How do we drive a fossil-free construction sector, if I understand correctly? But not only in Sweden, actually also in some other countries. Can you talk a little bit to that? So how, to, to Magali's point, how do we change yeah. the way we procure? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so, so that was actually, and, and I so much agree with what's been said here, that we have started to see some countries driving in procurement and also in, in UK actually incentivizing when it comes to how to reduce carbon emissions as well as incentivizing climate smart innovations in, in large infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. We also see these kinds of carbon calculations actually in procurement in Norway in some other countries as well. So what happened in, in, in the Swedish market and, and what the Swedish government did was actually to set forth roadmaps for how to do the transformation for different industries. And Skanska actually chaired the, the work with the roadmap when it comes to our industry. And what we did then was actually to start to collaborate with others, of course, peers within our industry, but also to start to look the whole value chain in order to identify what if what is needed to be done in order for us to, to reach a net zero construction industry by 2050. Actually, the Skanska target is at 2045, but, mm -hmm. but for everyone to, to agree upon. So what if we start to collaborate and do our utmost best what is needed to be done. And what we could see is that we do need to collaborate throughout the value chain, as well as to do that early on in design, in planning, understand how each and every one within the value chain actually plays an important part. So we got a tremendous engagement because those that are producing materials, those that are actually being the architectural firms like Sveco, those that are the energy companies, the transportation, but as well, and really to, I really want to put forth this, the finance industry, because we need to remember that our industry is a massive investment opportunity and object for long-term investments, as well as, of course, there are more to for, for green, bond, green bonds, as well as, um, so, so the investor perspective and the finance perspective is of utterly important. So to make a good deal, you have to understand the long-term value, also in financial terms. So having that whole value chain perspective to us was really important. I just want to point out another aspect because now we talk a lot about the green transformation, but I know in how you began it, Roland, regarding a just transformation to happen. I think for all of us to be very mindful about the social aspect because we will not come far if we can't combine the two. And something that we are doing together, Skanska and IKEA has a collaboration, or actually we, we have a, a company together. We call it Boklok, Live Smart, that means. Mm -hmm. And that is actually a modern way of building. So we're doing, we're doing wooden building, modular, and with, of high quality and sustainable. And most of them actually have solar cells also. Uh, what we are doing there is for us not just to have a carbon and co carbon calculation, we also set forth a cost calculation where we are aiming to our target group, which are for the many people. So our target group is usually, it is a daycare teacher. So, so those that are taking care of our small children or bus drivers. So we have a left to live on calculation, thinking of the customers, those, the many people, that do have below the medium income, but actually also need, of course, somewhere to live. And for us to be able to design and produce and, and have a concept that is of high quality, sustainable, and also affordable for the many people. And I think for us to have that kind of direction in Booklook to set forth our, our target group and understand how to combine high climate ambition 
as well as for the many people. I think that is really important for all of us to think about. It's a great example and really two companies teaming up um, because you saw there's an opportunity, a need for doing so. Yes, um, I'm sitting at the board and it's yes. Skanska and, and it's IKEA, Ikea people yeah. and it's a wonderful yeah. mix of different ways <laughs> and different logics <laughs> and it ends up in Buklok. <laughs> I have many questions to all of you, uh, but l ultimately these uh, moments are always too short. Um, I forgot to say, please do say if you want to actually interact or say something, react to what somebody has just said. Um, I would like to maybe make the link and just bring in Tom and, and Magali as well. When it comes to affordable construction, I mean, um, Tom, you made the point very clear. I mean. In Africa, there's a lot of informal settlements, and that's not the only markets. We can also look at Southeast Asia and other, where people are looking for these affordable solutions. And coming back to your comment before, that th there is something missing in actually helping us to plan for that. But maybe also to Magali, you work on some affordable construction solutions as well. Can, can we have maybe just a few minute conversation on that? What, what, what could really be done there, Tom? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I think informal settlements are just uh, a stage in the development of, of cities. Um, they, they are not uh, an aberration. And it needs a collaboration between government, uh, big business, and, uh, uh, and the informal dwellers, uh, as well as the informal sector. So government needs to legislate and act at the correct level and that legislation and action should be aimed at catalyzing actions uh, by individuals, at uh, empowering them, uh, at giving them the freedom to act and build their own homes. Mm -hmm. However, um, unfettered freedom, uh, of course, results in the chaos that we see in informal settlements. Uh, and there is therefore a need, a very genuine need to learn from uh, uh, leading cities, I, I'll, I'll mention cities uh, like Oslo, um, uh, as we heard from Andre, and and also start working with the uh, the companies which are competent in this to um, work together to design the framework for people to act. Um, we need to design the framework for people to act, and then when you go to the common man uh, in an informal settlement or in the formal sector, they do not understand climate change and how it impacts them. How do you communicate this in a language that they understand? Or how do you get action in a, uh, in a way that will attract them to do it? So um, I, I think rhetoric is, is good, but in order to reach the informal sector, they need to, to see that there's benefit in them acting sustainably throughout the value chain. And that includes, for example, um, unlocking different finance mechanisms for them. Uh, it includes, for example, um, giving them links into uh, the formal sector, um, as well as uh, um, opening them up opportunities for digitization, um, as we had from prior speakers. Uh, I'll end it there, but it's, uh, it's about collaborating with, uh, with the informal, um, yeah. as opposed to regulating them yeah. and stifling them. Thank, thank you so much, Tom. Um, Magali, Holtzim is working on some very affordable solutions. Would you, would you agree with Tom on these barriers and, and how, how do you see the market uh, taking these up or not? No, I think there's a, there a clear demand, um, as Tom said, and, and some clear barriers. So uh, let me maybe quickly explain what we do because, yeah. because we feel that uh, as a construction material company, being having the, the large footprint we have, we are in more than 60 countries. Um, we have a key role to play into uh, helping to bridge that gap of housing of the number of people who today don't have a decent roof on their head. And it's 1.2 billion, 1.5 billion numbers vary depending on the sources, but it's a lot. And um, um, so, so we have a partnership with Habitat for Humanity uh, in Mexico, in Philippines, in different countries. But what we did in Africa, which I thought was um, maybe unexpected, Mm. is uh, we, we printed, we did a 3D print of a school in Malawi last year. And uh, why unexpected? Because you don't necessarily think of 3D printing in Africa. But it's been quite successful because um, we can print 
the walls of the school in 18 hours. Much lower CO2 than traditional uh, building in Malawi. It's uh, bricks that are being cooked, so um, using quite a lot of trees, etc. So it's much lower CO2 than traditional building. Very fast. There is a shortage of about 40,000 schools in Malawi, so we could bridge that gap much quicker than traditional building. For the moment, we have in increased the number of people working because we are making the ink. It's concrete, but it's still called ink. Uh, within the country, so we have been recruiting people to do that and, and to manipulate and move the printer. We are about to launch, uh, we've signed and we are about to start the construction of 52 affordable houses in Kenya, 3D printed. So I think what we, and, and we partner with that with some startups who are helping on the microfinancing of those projects for the people to have access to that finance. So um, I'm not saying it's a, it's a silver bullet, but we are, we've been trying to think a bit differently on how we can uh, maybe accelerate what needs to be done. Might not solve all the problems that Tom has talked about, but we are trying to bring a bit of contribution to it. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and Luis, I would like to come back to uh, something you said before around digitalization, but also the work you're doing around carbon cost, etc but also a comment from Lena about the importance of finance. So uh, my impression is a lot of what we do is quite technical. So yeah, it's great that we can calculate all that carbon cost, EC3 from Skanska, open source does the same. But would you, would you agree that somehow we still need to mobilize a sector who may not be looking at that? Um, when you look from a finance perspective, um, you're you're a bit at a higher level. And I'm, I'm asking that because I would imagine that in, you have daily conversations with developers, with clients you are working with. So, so how, do you, how do you make that, that argument? Not quite sure I, I grasp the question. How do we make the argument to be able to convince? To, to go for uh, maybe the more holistic approach up front and how you can show those benefits of doing something differently mm -hmm. um, but you can also tell me i'm wrong because you see that things are actually changing but the impression i still no, but, get that we they still are changing but it's too slow too and slow. i actually think so. one one thing that we need to do is to admit that what took us here won't get us further yeah and 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 admit that we have been doing wrong we have been uh, doing things in the wrong way or with the wrong mindset and uh we had mentioned here early stages, early stages in a design of regardless which type of projects are the key to bring in the right competence, to bring in the right perspective, to set the right targets. You can never, yeah. never look at the early stages too little yeah. because that's the key factor to solve the problems that we have. And money talks, and we, we need to admit that as well, that money talks, and we need to drive the behavior that we want to see in connection to the money. And I think, Tom, you were touching upon that, and I think this is really important and, and key. How do we make it cheaper, cheaper to act green? And how do yeah. we uh, get the awareness in, the, in each organization regarding this? Yeah. That's the key things, I think. Yeah. And I, I maintain something you said earlier to ask the right questions mm -hmm. and do that at the very beginning uh, of, mm -hmm. of, of any planning. Um, Andre, last but not least for this kind of second round, uh, again, coming back to cities and, and your influence. And so how do, you, how do you work with companies to, uh, like Lena said, along the value chain? We really need to work all together along the value chain. How, how do you do that from the perspective of C40 and the cities you're working with? Or, or what more do you need from from business? Right. Yeah. Um, no. I mean, we we fully recognize that uh, you know cities cannot solve this issue by themselves, and so we need to look at the whole value chain. Um, and uh, I think also, I mean, to take it even a step back, I think you know the whole uh, climate regime in a way is centered around sectoral based emissions. So we need to break out of that a little bit to move to to look at you know reducing emissions from a from a, a value chain point of view, and I think also 
you know, in terms of really achieving circularity in society um, to move beyond the 3.4% circularity, et cetera, we need to even look beyond our own value chain and look at uh, value chains in relation to each other because, you know, what is waste in our value chain might be uh, a raw material in a different value chain. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it spans quite widely. Um, in terms of what at C40, you know, we, we try to, to work with uh, the business uh, uh, community in different ways. Um, we do have the, the Clean Construction Action Coalition that was launched at uh, the COP26. Um, and uh, uh, that is uh, uh, an attempt at, uh, you know, gathering uh, large companies that do represent all steps of the value chain of the built environment and that stand behind the similar targets that we have for our C40 cities uh, uh, in this space. So, you know, bringing these uh, these uh, corporate leaders uh, of the value, representing the value chain together with the cities to try to, to break down silos as we have discussed. Um, it's the only way, I think, in a way, uh, we need to, to get in the same room and, and talk the same language. Um, and we also, you know, we have frequent uh, city industry dialogues where, the, where the, the, the purpose is the same, to bring together city policymakers with, with industry. Um, so those are some examples of, of how we try to merge this. And then some of our cities have sort of, they have these dedicated climate business networks, uh, including in Oslo. That is, uh, you know, a, a way of uh, the city working directly with the business community through uh, through through networks and and maybe even testing some of their their suggested climate policies with the business community. So those are those are some examples. Um, and um, I mean, finally, sorry, uh, I, uh, you know, I like to translate uh, 2030 into months, and um, uh, we have to re half our emissions in our sector by 2030, and that's yeah. uh, 90 months from now. 90, uh, nine zero, yes, 90 yes. months, yeah, yeah. So how much is that per month? <laughs> I, I'm not so quick in doing the math, but it's, it's tremendous. And I, I'm really happy to see also this initiative from the C40, as you say, really putting an emphasis on this and bringing in, in business. And so it, it's great that this is happening. How do we all speed up together? Um, I know we're a little bit over time. I would just like to ask you all for a very brief statement. We're here in Stockholm for Stockholm Plus 50. We have just launched this morning the Stockholm Action Agenda that we have worked together with the Stockholm Environment Institute, WBCSD, uh, based on discussions with many of the companies on, so how do we transform value chains? And uh, obviously the, the three key items, just briefly around accountability and transparency, and that comes up a lot. So the data, the targets, and really measuring and, and, and showing the progress. Um, but very interesting as well, we call for a circularity protocol. There is such a need for more circular solutions, but there are important barriers in the way, and we need to work on that. Again, jointly, business, governments, and other stakeholders. And last but not least, a massive skills development initiative. And I think Anne Louise's point was so well made. We need to develop the skills of our employees and of the people we work with in the value chain. So these are three high-level topics. What we're very pleased is that this agenda will be taken up in the UNGA, COP27, but also this morning we heard from our representative from UAE for COP28, He's really looking to base um, their planning on this Stockholm Action Agenda. So your word will have weight. So I'd like to ask you, uh, what would you uh, want to um, give to this agenda? What recommendations would you like to give? Maybe I start here with uh, Magali first. Wow, a bit unprepared. <coughs> I would say, um, I, I said before, we need to incentivize companies so that lowering carbon becomes a benefit and not a negative. And I gave the example of concrete before, but that's the type of thing. So of course CO2 pricing is part of the solution, but I think we put a bit too much magic into the CO2 pricing. It's great, but yeah. it's not enough. But rethinking business models in such a way that performance prime over quantity, volumes, etc., or whatever it is that your industry emits CO2. I think um, if we could get there, we could uh, advance much quicker. Thank you. 
Lena. Well, I find it brilliant to focus on data and transparency, on circularity, and uh, as well as, and, and the last one also, to acknowledge the need for the competence and the expertise and experience. I would also like to add in innovation, because what we can see, there are two aspects of innovation. One is, of, is of course, that everyone are talking about that we will need to do innovate to, to reach net zero. But also, quite frankly, we know that a lot of innovation has already taken place. However, they need to be scaled. It's just like with the light bulb. It's a great innovation. If it was ju just one in the world, it would not have been as great as now when it's commonly used. So scale of innovation, I would like to add that one in. Thank you. Anne-Louise. Uh, I think there's some really good things uh, being said here. I would uh, like to highlight that uh, the things we already have and exist, we must value that really carefully, which also means that everything new that we are going to create from new material, that needs to cost much more than mm -hmm. making sure that you value what you already have. So we need to, it, today it's uh, more cheaper to, yep. to bring in new material and we need to change that. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. André? Yeah, a little bit of a similar point. I guess my answer is uh, reuse, reuse, reuse uh, in a way. it's. Um, I think the wasted resources in the built environment is unmatched by any other sector to some extent. And, um, and there are business models there, and we need to find these business models. It's a, it is an expression of the complexity of the industry that it's difficult to, to sort of to increase this reuse percentage um, or um, so, but I'm convinced that there are business models in that space and uh, we need to find them. Uh, it is a little bit of a uh, uh, sort of a, uh, a global north perspective in the sense that uh, in, in, in those cities, uh, most of the cities have been built. So there's, there's more potential for reuse. And in global south, there is uh, obviously uh, more new construction needed and going on. So that this is slightly different perspective, but still, I yep. would underline that. Thank you. Tom. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, yes, in the global south, we need a lot of construction. And I also agree with uh, um, Anne Louise, um, money talks and uh, yeah, it attracts. So in the global south, you have these governments. Uh, they need to, uh, whoever is giving them money needs to channel their decisions in such a way that they are making the right decisions at the right level. And those decisions should uh, empower and uh, facilitate the informal sector to unleash its energies mm -hmm. uh, towards um, um, low carbon solutions along the full value chain. Magali, Let's ask please. one. Yes, please. Just, please. just one quick one. One of the issues we have ab about values, value chain of, uh, of uh, waste streams, and the reason we don't put our hands on it in many countries, is because of landfilling. Yep. Yep. Could we have a policy ask at the COP27 that landfilling becomes forbidden across the globe? Here we are. Spot on. Circularity protocol. I think we would like to work on issues like that. Um, landfill is, is probably front and center. There's certainly many other things, but fully... fully That's an easy one. It Just forbid it everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's forbidden in Sweden, no? It is in Switzerland. I'm sure it is in Sweden as well. Yes. Um. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> I would like to thank you and apologies for going a little bit over time. Uh, thank you for uh, indulging with us. Again, um, we have hosted this together with the Stockholm Environment Institute, also Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction. So these conversations, we are taking them forward. Please stay with us also as we go again to COP27, COP28. We really want to create that, that movement globally to put the built environment really at the heart of climate solutions. So thank you very much to my speakers and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.